Back to Shred Guitar in the 80s. Today's gonna be a great, a fun day. We're gonna talk about some more incredible guitar albums from 1986. So many great albums that year. I'm gonna talk about Van Halen, David Lee Roth, Dr. Mastermind, Tony McAlpine, Vinnie Moore, CJSS with Chastain, um, some obscure metal stuff like Hex and Hellion and Bill Connors and Mike Stern and Alan Holdsworth and Eric Johnson. So it's going to be a fun episode, so sit back and relax and let's rock. The big news in 1986 was the split of Van Halen. Um, they actually split in 1985, but 1986 you had dueling releases from Van Halen um, with Sammy Hagar replacing David Lee Roth and David Lee Roth's solo album with the amazing band of Billy Sheehan, Steve Vai, and Greg Bissonette. Um, and you kind of, that summer of 86 was kind of all about Van Halen and David Lee Roth. Um, so let's start there. So you had David Lee Roth's Eat Him and Smile and Van Halen's 5150. And uh, for some reason, I don't know where I put my 5150 CD. Um, I know where all my David Lee Roth era Van Halen CDs are. But uh, I packed away some of my CDs and I think that my Sammy Hagar era CDs got put in the box with them. Um, with the others, but uh, I do have the Daily Roth album, which I just ordered again off eBay. I haven't even opened it yet. I really liked this album, the David Roth album, when it came out. I thought it was pretty mind blowing. I was a Steve Vai fan at the time. I actually had um, the album did with Alcatraz. Steve first came onto my radar with Frank Zappa. Um, I really didn't hear a lot of Zappa at that time, but I remember reading about him in Guitar Player magazine. And when he joined Alcatraz, I was really intrigued because I was a huge Yngwie fan, so I, I wanted to know who was replacing Yngwie and Alcatraz. And when I saw it with Steve, I, I thought it'd be cool to give it a listen. And I was pretty blown away by the Disturbing the Peace album. I thought that was an amazing album. Totally different than the Yngwie style, but totally unique. And Steve's a very unique player um, that really kind of created his own style. Um, and kind of took some of the Van Halen techniques and some of the Zappa stuff and all the different influences, kind of blended it all together in this kind of really cool, quirky, but deep kind of style. Um, and when I heard the David Roth album, I was blown away. Um, I was actually a Talus Billy Sheehan fan, um, big time in the Talus. And when I saw that they um, covered Shy Boy on here, I just, I had to listen to it. And Shy Boy was just amazing. Um, the interplay between Billy and Steve was just amazing. And you could hear where Billy took that and did it with Mr. Big and kind of ran with it. But this album's really, I think, held up over the years. I actually streamed it and listened to it recently. I love Big Trouble. That's one of my favorite songs by the, you know, the Dave era. I think that's the, the number one song. Ladies Night in Buffalo is another great song. Yankee Rose, the hit single, I think it's a great track. Um, That's Life. I'm a Sinatra fan, so you gotta love the Dave's version of That's Life. But I'm just a Dave Lee Roth fan in general. I much prefer the Dave era over the Sammy era, although I was a definite fan of Van Halen of any incarnation. Van, Eddie Van Halen was one of my all-time favorite players. But um, I tended, at the time, I think I listened to them both pretty equally, 51-50 and... Um, Eat Him and Smile. Although 5150 is incredible. Um, the song 5150 is one of the best, I think, Eddie's compositions along with solos he's ever put down. 
Um, I liked Inside. That's a cool ending track. Um, there's just a lot of tracks on that album that are great. I wasn't really a huge fan of some of the ballads. You know, Dreams was okay. It never really did a lot for me. Nice guitar solo. When Love Walks In was a cool song, but some of that sounds a little dated to me now, to be honest with you, where I throw in the old Van Halen before that with Dave singing, you know, on the Cradle of Rock, that will sound amazing and fresh 100 years from now. Um, but why can't this be love? I don't know. I, for some reason, I just don't go to that era of Van Halen very much, although I'm, a, like I said, a huge Van Halen fan. But the Sammy era, I think, hasn't held up for me nearly as much as the Dave. The Dave era always will be like my number one stuff. I mean, Eddie and Van Halen are definitely one of my all-time favorite bands. The Dave years. The Dave years, some of the best music ever, best rock music ever. I put it up there in the upper echelon. 1986 was the year the Shrapnel Records took off. I mean, you had all sorts of amazing releases. I thought I'd start with this one, Dr. Mastermind, the amazing Dr. Mastermind. Um, with Kurt James, the underrated, underground Kurt James. He's just an amazing player. Um, I actually got off eBay a few years ago some of Kurt James's solo stuff. And it's just amazing. I mean, you can play like, it sounds, kind of reminds me of like Tony Williams era, Holdsworth lines, kind of mixed in with some Mangve stuff and some Hendrix. I mean, Kurt is really an underrated player. I'm not sure why he's flown under the radar so much. I mean... You know, a lot of people have never heard of Kurt James. He's like one of the greatest guitar players that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, it's kind of sad in a way. I, I think the guy should be massive. Um, his playing on Dr. Mastermind was incredible. Um, he actually replaced Ingve and Steeler um, and then went on to join Dr. Mastermind. And I think he was the original guitar player and driver, the band Project Driver. But overall, you know, what can I say about Dr. Mastermind? Just some great power metal. American power metal with the amazing Dean Castronova on drums. Um, he would go on to have just an amazing career. I remember me and my drummer friend Breeze would sit around and just listen to these drum fills that Dean Castronova would do and just be in awe just how tight they were. Dean was just an amazing player back then and probably still is. I haven't heard him in years. But um, yeah, great stuff. Dr. Mastermind. Um, can't go wrong. Check it out. Kurt James, underground guitar hero. One of the biggest guitar moments for me was when Tony McAlpine released Edge of Insanity, which I'm going to do a feature on soon. Um, just an incredible album. You know, on the back you have the amazing Kramer Pastries playing. You can see his PV Classic amp up there. He used the MXR Distortion Plus into it. But being an Ingve fan, when I heard this, it almost had that Randy Rhodes tone, playing kind of like that neoclassical style with fast picking and legato. And it was right up my alley. I just love this album, and I still love it. It's probably one of my top five instrumental albums of all time. Um, if I had to rank my five favorite rock instrumental albums, which I'll do in the future, this would definitely be on it, um, along with Mind's Eye and David T. Chastain's instrumental variations and Yngwie's Rising Force. I consider that instrumental, even though it's a couple of vocal tracks. But this album is just amazing. Will of Fortune, The Stranger... He used to jam that with the band, the cool unaccompanied guitar solo, Quarter to Midnight. I always find it funny they said live guitar solo, but to me it sounded like the audience was just, you know, added to a studio track. I could be wrong, but I think that's probably what happened. It sounds like that to me anyway, because it sounds like he's playing in front of 100,000 people, and I don't think he was that popular at the time or that known with his debut. But uh, amazing solo nonetheless, amazing album. Just Empire in the Sky, The Witch and the Priest, one of my favorite songs ever. I just love The Witch and the Priest. What more can I say? The Raven, cool kind of Al Demiel, a muting, cool piano piece by Chopin. Yes, Tony McAlpine, Judge of Insanity, just a classic from 1986. You also had the debut from the amazing Vinnie Moore. I mean, what a combination, Vinnie Moore and Tony McAlpine, um, with In Control and Daydream, Saved by a Miracle. Hero Without Honor, Shadows of Yesterday. You know, Vinnie Moore is just definitely one of my all-time favorites and the man. And I actually did a couple retrospectives on this album, so if you get a chance, check it out. This is definitely one of my all-time favorite instrumental albums also. Another unbelievable album and influence on me was the amazing Eric Johnson with his Tones album. This is the actual original cassette that I bought back in the day, and I actually have it on album and CD now. It's my favorite Eric Johnson album. I know a lot of people love the one that followed up this album a few years later, and I love that one also. 
And solo-wise, he definitely is mind-boggling on that. But this album has kind of a charm and an atmosphere, and just captures the moment in time when I really discovered Eric Johnson. I love songs like Zap, Soulful Terrain, just two amazing instrumentals. Victory, another amazing instrumental. Trail of Tears, I think is one of his best songs. Um, Emerald Eyes, another really kind of just nice, catchy tune. Desert Songs are real moody. It's my favorite acoustic piece by Eric by far. You know, with his amazing descending fluid pentatonic scales and clapped any kind of woody tone bends. Eric is one of my top five biggest influences. Um, when I play kind of a blues rock style, it's Eddie Van Halen mixed with Eric Johnson. By far, those are the two biggest. Um, I love this album, Tones. Um, I did a video on Eric Johnson. If, if you haven't seen it and you're an Eric fan, you might enjoy that. So Eric Johnson, Tones, another amazing album from 1986. During the years 1985 and 1986, I think there was no band I'd listened to more than the band Loudness. Um, they were just an amazing band to me. Akira Takasaki's guitar playing was just everything I wanted to hear when I was a young player in 1985, 1986. You know, him, Ingve, um, David T. Chastain, Vinnie Moore, Tony McAlpine, Randy Rhodes, Eddie Van Halen, and Alan Holdsworth. Those were my bread and butter guys. And Warren D. Martini and George Lynch in there also. But his tone was just amazing. Um, and his, he was so fast. I mean, Akura could just rip, um, you know, these solos with these amazing riffs and the songs were catchy. I loved the whole band was amazing. They had little elements of Rush. You could hear like Judas Priest Accept in there. Some of the Van Halen kind of techniques, a lot of Randy Rhodes. Just great stuff, you know. Um, and then you could even turn on the radio and hear... <laughs> You know, Let It Go was blasting on the radio in 86 and all over MTV. Maybe not as much as it should have been, but I definitely caught it on there. But uh, this live album is really cool. It has songs from Disillusion, Thunder in the East, and Lightning Strikes, their album from 1986, which is an amazing album. Um, it also has some earlier, earlier songs, but I picked this live album because it's a great capsule. This was available only at import at the time, but if you're a Loudness fan, and you love the band during that era, I really recommend getting it. Um, 81, 86 Live, just an amazing record. And Loudness, an amazing band. And then you had Alan Holdsworth, the amazing Alan Holdsworth, released this incredible album, Octavictron, in 1986. You can see his Star Trek uniform there. Um, I love this album. I think the tone on this album might be my favorite Alan tone. Um, I love it. You know, it's a lot of synth act stuff on here, which is killer. The song Funnels is unbelievable. All of Our Yesterday is just a beautiful track. Looking Glass is another classic. non brood Condiment with that really cool kind of opening thing. The synth act. just an amazing album. Um, Alan was just an amazing player. And I saw him live a couple times in 86 and 85. Um, I remember meeting Alan and going backstage. And my buddy's like, hey, put your hands up against Alan and see who has the bigger hands, you know. Um, it was kind of cool. Alan's smoking a cigarette and drinking a beer and put his hand up. But uh, a really nice guy, um, especially to put up with that stupidity that um, we did. But uh, Alan was just great, and he was so modest and so humble and so down to earth. Um, I don't really remember whose hand was bigger um, at the time, but uh, my friend, he wanted to find out. But uh, yeah, this album is just amazing. Um, I still listen to this all the time. I love the vinyl version. Um, it has a cool back cover. It's a picture. I assume that's Alan. Uh, yeah, very special. Looking back on this album, Alan's legato approach had such a huge impact on me and some of the most beautiful sounds I've ever heard, um, you know, Alan has played. So definitely one of my favorites from 86 and my favorites of all time. So 1986, you also had Ozzy release The Ultimate Sin with Jakey e. Lee. And I really liked this album. I mean, Killer of Giants was just amazing. That little classical thing that he does towards the beginning um, after he does the interludes with the arpeggiated chords. I remember listening to that and just thought, that's brilliant. Did Jake play that? I mean, I, that was amazing um, playing. I just love that album. I love the song, or song. The, the whole album's great. I love the whole album. Um, Ozzy doesn't really like this album. I don't think he plays any songs from it anymore. Um, a lot of people refer to this as Glam Ozzy, the Glam Ozzy period. 
But uh, to me, I love it, you know. Lightning Straits is a great song. Like I said, The Ultimate Sin's great. The title track, um, Never Know Why. The Killer of Giants is definitely a classic. Shot in the Dark was the big radio hit. Um, Fool Like You, Secret Lover, another cool riff from Jake. Unfortunately, this would be the last album that Jake and Ozzy did. And I wasn't really a Zach Wilde guy. Um, I never really listened to a lot of Zach, so... I, Ozzy was one of my favorite singers. Black Sabbath was one of my favorite bands, and you know, but I, I didn't listen to Ozzy quite as much when he got uh, Zach. I, this wasn't a style that appealed to me as much. But uh, Zach's a great player, though. Don't get me wrong. But um, the Ultimate Sin is definitely an album that I love. Another album from 1986 that flew under the radar that I think every guitar player should have is definitely some Bill Connors. This is his 1986 release, Double Up. Just an incredible album, a follow-up to Step It, which he released, I believe, the year before. Um, definitely has a Holdsworth vibe. Bill at the time said he was listening to a lot of The Police, and a lot of his chord work was influenced by The Police. And he was listening to a lot of John Coltrane, and he had that Clapton feel, and that's where he came up with the, the legato kind of sound. And that could be, but when I hear it, I hear Alan Holdsworth. So... Who knows? But uh, I don't really care where he got it from because this album is so accessible and so wonderful. They're playing so amazing. Tom Kennedy and Kim Plainfield, just amazing on this album. The tracks, his legato approach is such an influence on me too. Um, just so seamless. His tone is so beautiful. And if, if you're a fan of guitar and you haven't heard Bill Connor's 80s stuff, I really recommend checking it out. Really check out all of Bill's stuff. Um, it was just amazing. He also had uh, incredible um, albums that he put out, some acoustic albums right before this, um, the stuff he did with Chick, and then he would return with more of a straight-ahead jazz album. But uh, Bill Connor is definitely an underrated player, and this is definitely one of my favorite albums from 1986. Bill Connor's Double Up, one to have. And then you have the two releases from Chastain, and if you watch this channel, you know I'm a Chastain fan. And I did a review on these both, and I won't talk about these too much today because I'm doing a special episode on David T. Chastain within the next month or so. Um, it's going to be very long, and I'm experimenting with tablature. Now I'm going to have solos, complete solos from David T. Chastain tapped out. I'm going to break down a style, and it's going to be a long video, and I'm going to do this time to time on some of my favorite players, especially ones that I feel haven't been covered by as many people like Dave. Um, these two albums were just brilliant. Um, I love them both very, very much, you know. World Gone Mad and Praise the Loud are just brilliant, brilliant albums. So you'll be hearing me talk more about Dave. And, and I, I really look forward to doing this video. I've been taking a lot of time and transcribing a lot of Dave's stuff, so it's going to be really cool. Another album that blew my mind in 1986 was Mike Stern's debut. Um, this album is just incredible. Mike Stern's one of those players like Eric Johnson and them that had a huge influence on me. Um, at the time, I could play kind of slow and I could play fast, but my medium speed sucked. I didn't have that where I could just cruise 16th notes, you know, from like 110 to 140 and just cruise it and just improvise and create. And Mike was the guy that really influenced me to get that down. And my technique's a little different when I'm playing the medium tempos, when I'm playing like that. It's a little more rotational. When I get into the really fast stuff, it's a little more elbow. Um, but uh, this album, just brilliant playing. Jaco Pastorius is on it. I mean, what else can you say? Mike Stern and Jaco together. Um, it's actually produced by Herm Bullock, a really good player from that, you know, just an amazing player from that era also that I was a fan of. But the songs in here, Upside Downside, Little Shoes, The Incredible Mood Swings, um, after you, uh, every song on here is brilliant. The writing's brilliant. The playing's just incredible. His tone and his lines. I'm just a huge Mike Stern fan too, and he's really had a huge impact on my playing. His melodic minor ideas, all that I've incorporated, um, and this is one of my favorite uh, Mike Stern albums. The mood on this is incredible. I've heard Sean do a couple covers from this album, Upside Downside, Mood Swings. They're just mind blowing, also great writing. Mike Stern's one of the best, and this is definitely one of the best from 1986. I mean, 1986, what a year for guitar playing. There were also a couple underground metal albums that I was really into in 1986. One of them was from the band Hellion with a guitar player, Chet Thompson, I believe his name was, and he did this, like, guitar solo. He held it upside down and played this classical thing. 
But he's a great kind of fiery player in the Randy Rhodes tradition. I believe he might have taken lessons from Randy. Hellion is a great band. The Amboyland, I think is how you say her name. Um, I could be wrong, but she's on vocals. Just an amazing singer. This album was a lot of fun. Um, I listen to this one a lot. Screams in the Night by Hellion. Really cool. Another one was this band Hex. They were on Shrapnel Records. Um, they were kind of American metal with a little bit of power metal. But really great guitar playing at the time. I thought it was really good. This is Under the Spell by Hex. Um, and I'm a sucker for that uh, middle 80s American power metal stuff. I love it. Um, because, you know, they had a little bit, you could hear the Van Halen and all that in their playing. The Randy Rose um, kind of mixed with the European influences, um, with the power metal influence. It's kind of a flavor that I like. Um, it's really cool. I'm not saying that they sound like Van Halen or anything, but uh, you could hear it in the guitar playing, the whammy bar playing, and the sensibility was coming a little bit from that L.A. scene, um, mixed with kind of the European influences. And this was a great album. I don't even know the guitar player's name. I bought this cassette back then. And it has second solo by um, Bauer, but it doesn't say who's in the band, you know. I don't know much about Hex, but I remember really digging this album, Under the Spell by Hex. Well, those are some more great albums from the year 1996. Um, I'm having fun talking about my favorite music also. I'm going to do a lot more playing and instructional stuff. And like I said, I have those, a new series called In Depth where I go in and really break down players and maybe in way, players that haven't been covered or things by players that haven't been covered. And I'm transcribing it all. I'm doing you know everything in tablature and notes and getting all the phrasing right. And I've been working on the Chastain one now for a couple weeks and I'm really looking forward to recording it. I think it's gonna be cool. And I'm gonna do some other players. Um, so who knows who I'll do in the future, but uh, so Look out for that. I'll be doing that. And I'm going to try to incorporate some more tabs in my videos also. I've got to figure out how I want to do it. Anyway, thanks for hanging out with me. It's been a lot of fun. I just have a blast talking about these guitar players. So thanks a lot. And to all of you that have liked and subscribed, thank you. And if you haven't, please do. Because I look forward to changing things up in the future. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So thanks for hanging out with me. And have fun picking.